What is primitive obsession? It's an anti-pattern where you're using primitive types to represent complex values in your domain. One example of that is using primitive types to represent entity identifiers such as GUIDs or integers. A popular solution for solving primitive obsession with entity identifiers is using strongly typed IDs. In this video I want to show you how to implement strongly typed IDs in your domain and what are the benefits of using this approach. I mentioned that primitive obsession is using primitive types such as a GUID to represent something more complex. Now in this case we are talking about the identifier of the customer entity. So how can we solve this problem? Well the solution is called strongly typed IDs which simply means creating a type that is going to represent the ID of this entity. So how can you implement a strongly typed ID in your domain? You can start off by creating a class that is going to represent your strongly typed ID and let's call it customer ID. Now this customer ID should contain the actual primitive type and then we can use a strongly typed ID in place of the primitive type. Now the problem with implementing this yourself is you're going to have to implement the uh, equatable interface for the customer ID. You're going to have to override the equals and you're also going to have to override the get hash code method and you're also going to have to override the toString string method and so on. So in order to avoid doing all of this and still being able to ensure that your customer ID is one strongly typed, second it has to be immutable and third it has to support structural equality. Is there a concept in C-sharp that supports all of these things? Well yes and it came about recently, well not so recently anymore, but it's called a record. So instead of using classes to represent strongly typed IDs, we can use a record. And we can also use the primary constructor feature of a record to define our strongly typed ID in one line of code. Defining our strongly typed ID as a record is going to take care of immutability, structural equality, and creating implementations for the iEquatable interface, the override of toString, get hash code, and so on. So records are a beautiful way to represent strongly typed IDs. Now, how do you use a strongly typed ID when you define one? If we go back to our customer entity, let's take the strongly typed customer ID and now we're going to use it in place of the GUID value that we had before. So now this is what our customer entity looks like and we can repeat the same approach for the remaining two entities that we have in our domain or rather three entities and then we're going to see some other implications of using strongly typed IDs. So let me move this into its own file and let's add the product ID here in the products feature folder. So product ID, we're going to make it a public record instead of a class and it's going to have a GUID value. All right. And now let's use the product ID in the product entity in place of the GUID here. So this is now a strongly typed ID, which we called product ID and we can easily identify which entity the strongly typed ID is associated with because they're going to have the same prefix in the name. So the product ID belongs to the product entity. Let's also add the order ID in the order feature folder. So let's create the public record order ID. Let's give it a GUID value and that's it and let's use it in our order entity. So here this becomes order ID. Now another interesting implication of using strongly typed IDs is you can also use them to reference other entities. Here we have a reference to the customer entity in our order aggregate and previously we defined this as a GUID. Now we want to use the strongly typed ID that we just defined. So let's replace the GUID here with customer ID. So now you can see when we are creating our order, 
and we pass it to customer we properly get the strongly typed customer ID value and set it on the customer ID reference in our order. The problem is we are trying to assign a GUID here as the strongly typed order ID, which will not work. So what you have to do is you take the GUID that was previously here and you define a new order ID instance and you just pass it the GUID value. Where this approach with strongly typed IDs really shines is in the line item example. And if you take a look here, we have a set of GUIDs that actually represent IDs for the various entities and the actual line item. The problem with this is that it's very easy to replace the actual values that you're passing into the constructor. So if I go to the reference where this is called, you can see that we are passing the IDs to the constructor of the line item. So what's stopping me from doing something like this? Let's say I switch places of the product ID and instead of product ID here, I have good new good. The issue with this approach is that I can easily mix them if I'm using primitive types, but if I switch this to be the order ID for the order ID, and the product ID for the product ID, now my constructor becomes strongly typed. Let's also replace the corresponding value in our properties. So this becomes order and product ID. And what we are missing is the line item ID. So let's introduce another strongly typed ID to represent the line item ID. So line item ID, it's going to have a good value and we can also move it into its own file. So let's go ahead and do that. And back in line item here, I'm going to accept a line item ID. And also let's replace the property type so that now it is strongly typed. So now our constructor has the same behavior as before. It's accepting the line item ID, the order ID and the product ID. But the difference is that now it is strongly typed. There is no way for us to pass the wrong ID value into the constructor because all of the values are strongly typed. So if we go back to the order add method, you can see that the first value that the constructor is expecting is the line item ID. So let's go ahead and create it. So I'm going to say new line item ID and I'm going to pass it the new good value. The second value that we are expecting is the ID of the order, which is the ID of the current instance. And the last value is the product ID. So now our constructor is strongly typed and we are passing it the line item ID, the order ID and the product ID respectively. It makes your method signatures much more honest. And one thing it also allows you to do is to remove dependencies on the actual entities. So for example, if we wanted to, we could replace this with product ID instead of product. So product ID and also accept the actual price for the line item, which is the money value object, and we can call it price. So now we can even take this and pass it as the arguments into our line item constructor. I'm going to let you be the judge of which method signature looks better. Is it the one accepting the product and then using the properties of the product instance or the one accepting the product ID and the price of the line item directly. Also, the same can be applied here. Instead of accepting a customer when creating an order, we can accept a customer ID and we can use this customer ID to populate the customer ID reference on the order aggregate. I'm going to show you one more example where strongly typed IDs are useful and that is method signatures in services like a repository. Let's say I create an interface for the iCustomer repository in our customer's feature folder. And let's say that I want to have a method on this interface to get a customer by the ID. So I'm going to have it asynchronous, so returning a task. It may or may not return a customer, so I'm going to use a nullable reference type and I'm going to call it get by ID async. You can see that by default, we could be using a GUID value to represent the customer ID. And this is not problematic. We can implement the interface like this.
and we can use the GUID value to match it to the customer in the database. But the better approach would be to use a strongly typed ID. So here, instead of the GUID, we would be using the customer ID. With this approach, our method definition becomes much more expressive as we are clearly communicating that we are expecting a customer ID, which is strongly typed, to be able to implement this repository interface. I'm curious to hear what you think about using strongly typed IDs in your domain, like for example in the line item entity, which has references to the order and product entities, and also the ID of the actual line item is strongly typed. One slight problem with using strongly typed IDs is that they do not play well with ORMs like EF Core. So if you are using strongly typed IDs and you want to write link queries with EF Core, you're going to have to define a conversion from the strongly typed ID into the appropriate primitive value in your database and also from the primitive value back to the strongly typed ID. If you do define this conversion with EF Core, then it's going to properly be able to translate queries containing strongly typed IDs. If you don't want to implement strongly typed IDs yourself, there's a nice NuGet package that you can check out, which is called strongly typed ID. I, I believe you were never going to guess it. It's a popular library by Andrew Locke, which contains a source generator to define your strongly typed IDs by using attributes. So you can also check this out. And I do hope that you enjoyed this video about strongly typed IDs. If you did, then make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm, and until next time, stay awesome.